Hi friends, welcome to EPG Partshala project. Here I am Dr. Bindu B, Assistant Professor, Bharatiya Plus Training College, Thiruvananthapuram, Kerala. Today, we are going to discuss about the economic perspectives of education. Let me start the module on economic determinants of education. Let us have a look into the main objectives of this module. First, to explain the relationship between education and economics. Second, to analyze the various economic determinants of education. Third, to explain the impact of economic determinants on education. Fourth, to gain insight into the strength, weaknesses, opportunities and challenges of globalization. Do you have any idea about economics? Most of you may not be aware of the theoretical aspect of economics, I am sure. But we cannot deny the practical part of the subject, since we are dealing with many aspects of the subject in our daily life. For example, when we are going to a market, public places, dealing with money, etc., many times this may be the main theme of discussions in our television channels, mainly because of the fact that economics play a catalytic role in the pace of development of human race. It is a contributing factor in the rapid progress and prosperity of individuals as well as nations. While discussing about the individual development, we know that education is the promising factor. It seems that economic development of an individual is not fulfilled without education. Education and economics are closely related. The development in one sector adds to a progressive change in the other sector. So let us see the various aspects in economics that are detrimental in the educational progress of a nation. Before that, we must see why so much importance is attached to this subject. In the modern times, economics has become the center of various activities and nowadays economic activities form the basis of all other activities. If we analyze what is happening in our day-to-day -day life, we can see that economics plays an important role in the life of man. Food, clothing, and shelter is considered as basic needs of man. To get these needs, we must earn money. For earning money, we need to engage in different kinds of activities, work or make an effort. These efforts lead to satisfaction. We are always interested in achieving our aims and satisfying our wants, but there lies a problem. We know that the resources are limited and the wants are unlimited, which will end up in choosing between the different options. It is necessary that one have to make an intelligent choice. In the modern world, human needs have grown so enormously that it is difficult to say which need is primary and which need is secondary. Man has to choose the most urgent one from the limited resources at hand. Here lies the importance of economics. The knowledge of economics enable a person to make proper use of resources available to him. Do you know why individual development is so much important? Development of each individual contributes to the development of whole nation. The advancement in science and technology could be built only on proper economic foundation. For example, we are conducting research on various disciplines and all these research work need to be funded properly, which require huge amount of money. All this make clear that education has many economic determinants. The concept of education has undergone many changes. Education should be in according with the needs of the society. A modern concept of education reveals that it should be valuable in multitude of dimensions. First, it should lead to all round development. That is, in our national perception, education is essentially for all. This is fundamental to our all round development that is both material and spiritual. Second is the acculturating role. That means, it has a power of making cultural and psychological change. Education has an acculturating role. It defines sensitiveness and perceptions that contribute to national cohesion, a scientific temper, and independence of mind and spirit, thus furthering the goal of socialism, secularism, and democracy enshrined in our constitution. Third, it is meant for development of manpower. That means, education develops manpower for different levels of the economy. It is also a foundation on which research and development flourish, being the ultimate guarantee of national self-reliance. Lastly, in the sense that it is an investment, education is a unique investment, the present and the future. The cardinal principles is the key to national policy of education. 
Now, there is a relationship between education and economics. We shall discuss it. Education and economics has got a very positive relationship from the earlier times of human history. Both are closely interrelated subjects. Why is it said so? The first reason is that the level of education of the masses influenced the economy of the nation. Secondly, economic conditions exert the demand for highly educated skilled persons. It is rightly said that the education system of any nation is a mirror through which can be seen the image of the nation being shaped and likely to be shaped. What can you infer from this? Education is the wealth of knowledge acquired by an individual after studying particular subject matters or experiencing life lessons that provide an understanding of something. How can we provide education? Education requires instruction of some sort from an individual or composed literature. Education can take place in formal or informal settings. Our education is commonly and formally divided into stages such as preschool or kindergarten, primary school, leading to secondary school and higher secondary school and then college, university or apprenticeship. Self-sufficiency of an economy depends upon education. Hence, it is a prime variable for a particular country. With regard to the economic determinants of education, many factors such as what is the culture of the economy, then how its function, the policy of ruling governments, the type of resources available, etc. It's at much influence in the education process. We are aware of the fact that many factors contribute to the development of education. At the same time, there are many factors which can act as a hindrance to the progress of education. Hence, education depends upon certain economic factors. Let us see what they are. First, the type of economy itself. Do you know what is meant by an economy? An economy is a system. A system in the sense, do not many things. It may be the management of household in the society, or it may be the efficient use of resources, or the management of wealth of a country, or it may be the management of income and expenditure of a region or a country. One can come out with many interpretations for the term economy. We know most of the economies are faced with some problems. Do you know what is the basic problem in every economy? In every economic system, optimal allocation of resources is the central problem in every economic activity. This is because every society has to choose between the most urgent wants and the less urgent wants as the resources are scarce and the wants are unlimited. The way the economy chooses determines the nature of the economy. This can be classified into capitalist economy, socialist economy and mid-set economy. Let us see one by one. Capitalist economy is an economic system where the means of production are owned by private individuals. It is operated to earn profit. The main features are private ownership, free enterprise competition, profit motive and policy of non-interferences by the government. It allows full freedom to the individual to pursue his ends unmindful of what happens to others. The second type of economic system is the socialist economy. Socialism is a type of economic system where the means of production are owned and operated by the state, although the degree of state ownership varies from country to country. The main features of socialist economic system are state ownership of means of production, emphasis on social welfare, economic equality, elimination of competition and establishment of classless society. The last type is the mid-set economy. Mid-set economy is a bridge between the extreme ideologies of capitalism and socialism. A mid-set economy is an economic system consisting of either of either markets and pla economic planning, public ownership and private ownership, free markets and economic interventionism. The state has to roll a positive role in strengthening economic stability, promoting economic growth, providing full employment for reducing insecurity and minimizing inequalities. Mid-set economy comprises of both public sector and private sector. What will be the intention of both these sectors? As you know, both function with entirely different objectives. The private sector is guided by profit motive and the public sector stood on welfare concept. The education sector is influenced by the nature of economy prevailing in the region. The type of economy decides the structure and functions of education institution which can be public, private and joint sector. For example, in our country there are government owned institution, 
government aided institutions and private educational institutions. The second determining factor is the development nature of the economy. We know economies are classified into developed as well as developing economies. Many factors can be attributed to the pace of development of a country. In the educational sector, the economic development of the economy has a significant role to play. This point to the fact that what is economic development? The economic development can be defined in many on the basis of first rate of growth of national and per capita income, the extent of industrialization and share of contribution of agriculture, industrial and service sector, technological inputs in various sectors, the standard of skill formation and utilization of resources, the advance of the whole community and the human development index. All these factors have a direct link with the education process carried out in our country. Education in a way determines the gross national income and per capita income of the country as educated laborers earn more income. In most of the developing economies, labor may be surplus due to increasing population. This may result in unemployment, low income, poverty and inequality. In a sense, the situation itself acts as a barrier in further educational development. The third determinant is population. One of the formidable problems we stare at in the phases is a rapid increasing population, which offset every endure for development. Demographic explosion can be considered as a mother of all problems. How population is becoming a problem? Our population is increasing annually at a rapid rate of 2.5 percent. This next to China has little less than three times the population of USA, 21 times the population of Canada, and more than six times the population of Japan. These are various problems associated with the increase in population and out of them the effect of it in education matters mostly. Almost half of the population of our country is less than 16 years of age. The young population requires a proportionately larger outlay for supporting the social services needed for it like education, health, transport, housing and other facilities. It is impossible for a developing country for providing all these amenities in requisite adequacy. The other problems are too many pupils at all levels, poor building infrastructure and equipments, wastage and stagnation, poor staff, unemployment, poor quality of education, student indiscipline and other allied problems at various stages of education. Connected with this is the literacy level of the masses that is the nest determinant of education. What does it mean by literacy? Being literate means the capacity to read and write and know the four function of arithmetic. Our government spends crores of rupees on providing literacy to its masses. The reason may be very much clear to you. Literacy is the key for socio-economic progress because literacy can act as a foundation on which other sort of development could be built. Why the literacy has so much power? Literacy will help to reduce unemployment and increase earnings and thereby to reduce poverty and acquire better standards of living. This will result in further acquisition of education of future generations also. Another factor which has a greater impact on education is the level of poverty of the people. You may be quite familiar with the term poverty which states the poor condition of the people. Many people living in poverty are unable to attend school from a very early age. Families may not be able to afford the necessary clothing or house school supplies. Others may not have a way for their children to get to school. Whatever the reason, there is a clear correlation between families living in poverty and their lack of education. What makes the situation worse is that without the ability to attend school, many people go through life illiterate. The literacy rate in countries with high poverty levels indicate that these two are linked. Let us see how this happened. Low literacy rates can affect societies in various ways including the labor force and politics. Obtaining a basic education could bring 171 million people out of poverty. This leads to a bad cycle. Do you know what it is? Poverty prevents people from gaining a good education and not obtaining an education prevent people from escaping poverty. Another factor Having a great impact is the technology. What is the role of technology in determining the level of education? Will it enhance the productive capacity of the people? 
Yes, productivity is significantly enhanced by the application of the advanced technology. Research and application of better technology can increase the supply of natural resources, reduces waste stages, enhance the quality of products and programs and bring about overall progress. Technological advancement have always been viewed as a support and enhancement for schools and other educational projects. During the 20th century, these advances were viewed much like a appliances that could make the home more efficient. Today, however, new technological developments starting with network personal computers influence curriculum decisions, modes of instruction and communication with families and communities. For example, think about the utility of the mobile phone you are having. For the establishment of good technological integrated class, we need strong economic background which poor countries may lack. Another determining factor is socio-economic status. Socio-economic status usually referred as SES is often measured as a combination of education, income and occupation. It is commonly conceptualized as the social standing or class of an individual or group. Low SES and its correlates such as lower education, poverty and poor health ultimately affect our society as a whole. Since families from the low SES communities are less likely to have the financial resources or time availability to provide children with academic support, it will cause a barrier in providing education to the coming generation. The next detrimental factor is availability of infrastructure facilities. You may be well knowing the term infrastructure facilities. Infrastructure facilities have a direct role with the level of education of the masses. It provides basic amenities which provide the quality of life. What will happen to our education system if there are absence of building, transport facilities, etc.? Infrastructure can be broadly divided into economic infrastructure and social infrastructure. Economic infrastructure supports economic activity and is often characterized by user pays or demand based revenue streams such as tolls on toll roads or landing fees for an airport. Social infrastructure is a subset of the infrastructure sector and typically includes asset that accommodate social services. Examples of social infrastructure assets include schools, universities, hospitals, prisons and community housing. Social infrastructure does not typically extend to the provision of social services such as the provision of teachers at a school or custodial services at a prison. Both have an equal role in the upliftment of education facilities of a region. Another crucial factor that has a strong influence on education is the disparity in rural and urban areas, which we usually refer to as regional imbalances. This may be the result of unbalanced growth model, which give priority to urban centers only. We can clearly observe with our naked eyes the difference between the rural and urban areas. Education and health facilities may be high in urban areas, while it is very low in remote areas. In such conditions, educational level of the masses living in these two areas may differ due to illiteracy, low aspirations, low level of income, consumption, standard of living, etc. Balanced growth, which envisages doing something everywhere, can develop all regions. Another factor that affects the education pattern of the country is the nature of planning. It is recognized that we are living in a knowledge society which means that production activities in the 21st century will become increasingly knowledge based with science and technology contributing significantly to country's economic growth. In this context, educational planning can lead the country to prosperity and development. The need for planning the educational venture of a country may be emphasized on several grounds. First, education transforms raw human material into human resources or manpower or more appropriately into human capital. The educational sector plays a crucial role in national development by providing the manpower requirement of the economy. It is therefore necessary to plan education so that the mismatch between the output of educational system and the input of job market are minimized and manpower with varying skills is made available to the economy in required quantities. Second, 
Investment in education in many modern economies form a sizable part of public expenditure. It is therefore necessary to ensure that investment in education must earn returns as in other sectors. Third, since equality is one of the objective of many modern welfare states and since investment in education is recognized as one of the factor in the development of human capital an equitable distribution of educational opportunities need to be planned properly with a view to maximize social welfare. In other words, it is essential to plan education with a view to move forward towards a just social order. Economic decisions of the government will also act as a detrimental factor in education. The economic decisions of the government are usually reflected in the budgets. Can you define the term budget? A budget is a legal document that is often passed by the legislature and approved by the chief executive or the president. The two basic elements of any budget are the revenue and the expenditure. Government revenues are derived mainly from taxes, while government expenses include spending on current goods and services. The amount of money spent on education determine the growth, quantity and quality of educational services available in the country. For example, in India with the introduction of five-year plans, the growth achieved in educational sector is tremendous. Next is the price mechanism. In order to determine the role of price mechanism in educational development, first we should understand what is price mechanism, how is it determined, what factors influence it. The mechanism which determine the price of all goods and services through the forces of demand and supply is called the price mechanism. The forces of demand and supply are called the market forces in the economy. In the education sector, the demand and supply of education is determined by the market forces. Those services or areas that are highly demanding such as information technology may be in high demand and more resources are devoted for the production of such demanding courses. Other factors that determine the education are the cost of education, the money at once spent for education is named as cost of education. Certain spending are recurring, example, salary to teachers and administrative staff, addition of books in library, equipment in laboratory, while others are non-recurring, that is, no need to spend money annually on land, buildings, etc. There are two type of cost, institutional cost, for example, the cost of fixed assets that has to be managed by the institution and private cost, example, expenses borne by the parents to educate their children. Next is the returns from education. It is true that like any other investment, education earns returns. The returns can be classified as present satisfaction or future satisfaction. That is, between the enjoyment of education for its own sake, which we can call it as consumption function, and the anticipated enjoyment of a higher monetary and or psychic income in the future, which can be termed as investment function. Availability and investment in human resources is another factor. Human resources are the principal asset of every country and required by all educational enterprises. But without investment in developing the capacity to acquire skills, build knowledge and innovate, the potential for human resources to attract economic investment is limited. More broadly, human resources development contribute to civil liberties, political stability, improved population, health, and reduce crime and corruption, advancing economic development. And this complementarity creates a cycle and a potentially sizable source of sustainable economic growth. The employment level of the masses is another crucial determinant of education. Most of the cases there happens to be unemployment and underemployment, which in turn may affect the educational attainments. This situation is a case in which people have work, but not to their full potential on the basis of working hours, productivity and income earn. Shortages of capital are the cause of unemployment and underemployment. Population explosion may result in unemployment, poverty and low level of education attainment. Another factor is the growth rate of the economy. In the simplest manner, economic growth is identical with prosperity and better life. Faster economic growth helps the people of a country to enjoy higher standards of living. It leads to better social services. For the economist, economic growth means increase in the net national income during the given period of time. 
the system of education and economic growth is given, social setup are interrelated. One cannot exist without the other. Deterioration in education result in slow economic development. Education influence indirectly the economic development through increased saving for small families and by developing right kinds of attitude and skills and by removing some of the obstacles to social change, innovation and progress. More education means more earnings and small family and more earnings lead to more saving and mobility to higher social levels. Education is an agent and also a condition for change. Educated people are more likely to adopt innovations and thereby to increase productivity. Education influences the economy of a country directly through employment, composition of labor forces, mobility and division of labor and productivity. Investment in social overheads is another determining factor. The productive potential of a country is affected from its education, health and sanitation status. Even though investment in these areas do not give direct returns to the state, it is essential to make the population healthy, educated and competent and raises the productive potential of the country. The expenditure in these sectors is known as social overloads. Human capital is a determinant of economic growth. Although human capital includes education, health and the aspect of social capital, this investment in human capital act as another determinant to education, economic reforms. The economic reforms adopted by the various ruling government over time have a significant influence on the education sector. For example, the national policy on education in 1986 attempt to equalize educational opportunities among different social groups. The economic liberalization programs that came in the last decade of 20th century changes the picture of education across the globe. Nowadays, the term frequently used in economic world is globalization. See, globalization is not a new concept, either for India or for any country in the world. It is a historical process started long ago and it is a process which is still going on. Globalization is a process of integrating the nation states by removing or minimizing the restrictions on the movement of material resources, financial resources, labor, technology and ideas. With the significant changes in the technology relating to transport and communication and with the changes in public policy relating to trade in goods and services, the process of globalization is getting accelerated. In many countries of the world, the initiation of economic reforms and adoption of strategy of liberalization and market economy had made its impact upon the education scenario. Quantitative expansion is inevitable since this has to meet the growing needs of the population. The most crucial issue is how to uphold the effectiveness of the system. Interest and concerns about global issues will affect our country's schools and our attitudes towards education. The chief issues are concerns of weaker institution that is a high disparity in education standards and quality of education offered by Indian universities and colleges is of great concern to all. National and global competition may create problems of survival of weaker universities and colleges. Developmental disparities and unsolved Indian problems which indicates that many colleges and universities were started in India for removing regional imbalances and for supporting education of weaker and disadvantaged classes particularly of women. These institutions and other development programs for weaker classes are still facing resource constraints which are further aggravated by ignorance, poverty and disadvantages of the people they serve. This is resulting in widening divides and in keeping many educated from weaker and disadvantaged section outside the job and employment market. The challenge of these marginalized and deprived to the system of education is enormous. Next, weak linkage of education with the developmental process is creating frustration among graduates when they find that education is not so useful in employment and in work situation. Finally, high cost of higher education, this means that the unit cost of traditional education, particularly of professional education is quite high and has gone out of reach of the Indian middle and lower classes. Many private entrepreneurs have started the educational institutions for offering creamy courses with marketing approach and have raised fees not affordable to majority. 
subsidy to the education by the state is not the right solution in the present situation when numbers aspiring for higher education is large and ever increasing. Thus, the strength and weaknesses of globalization upon the educational sector has to be analyzed. Let us look into the strengths. They are few globally renewed educational institutions, huge demand is there that is estimated for population between 18 to 23 age group, growing middle class with increasing incomes, growing economy with numerous employment opportunities and growing markets. There are also weaknesses. They are lack of infrastructure, shortage of trained faculty to meet the increasing demand, highly complex and unclear regulatory framework at center and state level and also regional imbalances. The opportunities are unsaturated demand for quality global education, low gross enrollment ratio in higher education, sharp decline in dependency ratio predicted in the next 30 years. Finally, have a look into the threats. High time lag in introduction of reforms due to various reasons are there, deterioration in quality of education, especially in private sector due to lack of availability of trained faculty and there is over regulation, control over course, curriculum, entrance, test, fees, etc. So, dear students, hope now you may understood the relationship between education and economics, the role and effect of various economic factors in the education programs, the impact on country's economic growth and prosperity. To conclude, we should make all efforts to check the barriers posed by economic hurdles 